This is the I'm Possible Project show, where we interview real people who have achieved incredible feats in the face of overwhelming odds, showing that impossible is just a state of mind and that anything is possible. I'm your host, Joshua Rivetall. Today, in episode 34, Now I See, I talk to Maria Grazia Butita. Let's jump right in. Maria Grazia Butita, and she, uh, I've known her for several years, and we've worked together on some stuff, and she'll maybe talk about how we met and all that. I don't know. We'll see. We'll find out. But she's a native Sicilian Italian speaker, and she's currently pursuing a master's degree in clinical mental health counseling from the College of New Jersey. And Maria Grazia speaks to college students and organizations about her blindness, along with her long-term battle with depression and anxiety. In 2015, Maria Grazia co-founded an Instagram social media campaign, the hashtag YSS, or Your Sunglass Selfie Project, using the hashtag, hashtag I for a cure, in an effort to tear down stigma and negative assumptions tells about the many different types of blindness that exist, including her own cone dystrophy. When not working, Maria Grazia loves spending quality time with family and friends, hiking, collecting sunglasses, exercising, shopping, and hanging out with her two therapy dogs, Happy and Lucky. And her one true weakness is espresso and lots of it. I totally get that. I'm a big coffee fan. I'm on my fourth cup today. And Maria Grazia, thank you so much for coming on to the show and for hanging out with us. It's good to have you. Hey, Josh. How are you, my friend? It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, it's such a pleasure. I'm, I'm glad we could do this. Good to have a different variety of people on the show, people who I've just met, people who I've never met, and of course, friends. And it's good to talk to someone who's familiar, Mm -hmm. and and you are someone who I'm familiar with, maybe not our audience, but they're going to get to know you a little bit. And you are way more than that, whatever that bio, 100 words, 120 words. You got a lot more going on in your life and your world. And I've, could you give us a little background on your life for the benefit of the listeners? Where you've been, where you're going, what's you know the ups and the downs, and and the Maria Grazia Boutita experience. Yeah, sure. Um, so it's it's kind of long, but I'll I'll try to sort of shrink my life in, in a few sentences. <laughs> but so for those listening, I was born and raised in Sicily, and uh, you know, growing up, I was bullied a lot uh, because I was different. And, you know, when I started going to school, teachers thought I was mentally challenged. And I was just very blessed to have parents who kind of just didn't believe that. And finally, uh, we went from one doctor to the next. But finally, at 14 years old, I was diagnosed with an eye disorder called cone dystrophy. What that means is I'm legally blind and then I have to wear sunglasses all the time because I'm just constantly blinded by light. And it gets really painful um, but after, really after that, after high school, I was, you know, kind of told that I wasn't smart enough to go to college. And again, I'm, you know, this might be a surprise for a lot of people, but I grew up in a country where there was a lot of stigma against, you know, people with physical and mental disability. So eventually about nine, year, nine years ago, I moved to New Jersey um, and my life changed. You know, I finally got in contact with the Commission for the Blind you know, I started at a community college, and uh, and then things just kind of went downhill from there. I was starting to experience panic attacks. I was suicidal, and I was just about an ending a really toxic relationship. Uh, and this is where you come in, my friend. So, you know, I at one point, my friend, we were walking at Bergen Community College, and uh, I bumped into one of my professors at the time, and she said, you know, you got to come see this show by Joshua Rivettel. Um At the time, it was called, uh, you know, The Gospel According to Josh Now, called Kicking My Blue Jeans in the Butt. And, and so she said, you got to go. And I finally went. And um, so really, that's how we met. But, you know, eventually I was diagnosed with depression and an anxiety disorder. But but really, Josh, it was your play, you know, being, being in the audience and, and you talking about your own experience First of all, losing your father uh, by suicide and then just talking about your own experience with with chronic depression and and things like that. And the relationship, I kind of just felt like you were talking about my story as well. And and so really, you know, again, your your play was life changing and I'm just so blessed we met and, uh, you know, we started building this, you know, friendship as well. Um, But really my journey toward recovery started at that point. And so I guess where I'm at today is not in a perfect spot. You know, like I said, this week, 
uh, you and I, Josh, talked real quick, but, you know, I told you I didn't have a perfect week. But again, it's about having therapy, medication, and just ha- having that good support system in place is what always gets me through those those tough moments of my life. So, so really, that's just kind of a quick, you know, uh, overview of my background. And so, so powerful and so many ups and downs and the beauty... I think is the fact that you were willing to maybe maybe not so much at first, but you were willing to accept the diagnosis and then get treatment and help. And um, personally, I'm, I'm I'm grateful for our friendship and and for you know the steps that I've seen you take throughout the past. I want to say about three and a half years or almost four maybe, and and just who you've become and blossomed into. And there really is no greater re- reward than having someone who found the value in life after something that I did, you know, and, and you hope you can reach one. And I think we reached a few more than that, but um, the fact that you're on here and you're, we're talking and you're doing well, nobody has perfect days and weeks and months. I've, I've had some struggles lately myself that have necessitated new coping skills and new, new medication and new this and new that. And that's what we have to do. That's what we have to do. We'd have to do that if we were diagnosed with diabetes or, or some kind of, you know, there's, there's new tactics to manage any kind of health condition. I'm glad you're managing yours. I'm glad you're here. Growing up in Sicily, <laughs> especially being different, blindness, mental health conditions, how do people manage and deal with that kind of stuff if they're not getting actual help? What is that? How does it manifest? Is there a lot of suicide? Is there a lot of abuse? I mean, what? What? It, because if nobody's getting help and nobody's talking about it, where does that energy go? What have you seen? You know, I mean, you know, it's it's really just recently. I think I've, you know, you you hear somebody talking about depression, but. I, I mean, I, I don't really know if it's part of the culture, really, that you're just not supposed to talk about your feelings. Um, and, and so the way I'll tell you, the way I used to cope with it is the way that I feel like a lot of people cope with it, where it's they use their family as a support system or, you know, maybe they use their religion to sort of, you know, kind of... Uh, battle it. You know, I like to think that we're making progress even in, in like Sicily where I grew up, but, but yeah, it's still tricky and there's, there's definitely, um, I feel like we're a little bit behind than we are here in the United States. Um, so I'm mm-hmm. hoping that, you know, with time we can reach that point where it, it becomes something that we can easily talk about, um, just sort of what we're doing here today. Because you weren't able to manage your mental health. I mean, you kind of alluded to it, you got, or you kind of stated it, that you were a bit suicidal when you were in the States sure. and, and, and all that. How did you, from the point of, okay, like I met Josh's show and I realized I have a quote unquote issue and I need to get help. What did that process look like? And how did you, how did you feel about getting help? And then what does the help look like in the aftermath of actually going out there and doing that? Yeah, so so again, just kind of going back to your show, um, I'm, I'm watching the show, and then I remember, because I remember having these feelings, and at the time, I really didn't call them anxiety, and I didn't call them depression, and I really just couldn't understand why I didn't want to live. Um, all I know is that I was just overwhelmed my entire life, and I just really didn't know what was going on, but... Uh, so after the show, I remember we had, um, you know, you presented a panel as well, and, and another of my friend was, was at the panel. And um, so that conversation, so I remember um, reading a list of what depression looked like. And it, it had, um, you know, it was listing like feeling hopeless. And and at one point I hear the, the word suicide, and that just triggered so I was sitting next to my friend and I knew I wanted to get up and I wanted to run away and I just I just didn't know what to do with all that because it finally hit me at that point, oh my God, I am feeling suicidal and I, I need help. I need to get it. I don't know how and I don't know when or where, but I need help. So after the show, my one friend kind of just tapped me on, the, on my shoulder and she said, are you okay? And I think it was at that point when I just started to cry. I just kind of, you know, we, we stayed and chatted for about, several hours. She gave me her number. 
Uh, my friend took me home. And I thought at one point, once I acknowledged that I was depressed and I was suicidal, I realized that I needed help. And so one of the first steps I had to take was to make sure that I told my mom, who was my biggest support, and told her I needed to tell her that I was suicidal and that we needed to get help immediately. Uh, I'll tell you, I, Josh, I was against seeking help. I was, I am taking medication today and, you know, and I'm, I'm proud to be where I'm at today, but I wasn't always so proud of it. And, you know, for a long time, I was embarrassed, but, but really once I, my mom was in and I told her how I was feeling, she was super supportive. And that's when we sort of just started, you know, looking online. Eventually I, one of my friends recommended a great therapist. Um, at the time. And, and so just really, that's where my journey began. And we kind of just both started to, I guess I really started to get educated about my mental illness. And, uh, you know, I just, I eventually started to accept it. And I just had my family and my friends kind of support me along the way. The, the support system thing, I think, is huge. It's huge, the fact. And, and I'm, I'm kudos to your mom, Francesca. Yeah. And, uh, I we've only I only met your mom in passing like I think twice. And so we've never we haven't really gotten a chance to really chat or, you know, shoot the breeze for a while, but knowing you and having read your book and being very involved with your work and what you do, I feel like I've gotten a chance to know your mom really well in a certain sense, especially maybe when it comes to being a mom. And what a great mom. What a great human She's being. Terrific. <laughs> Absolutely. Wow. I just, wow. Even, because yeah. I get to reach thousands and thousands of high school, middle school, and college students every year, maybe on tens of thousands uh, a year at this point. And it's not as common as I wish that parents are as supportive as they should be when a child is bumping up against a mental health diagnosis or, or something of the sort. It's it manifests its way into they're looking for attention or they're they're just being an X, Y, Z again. You know, they're being a bitch or they're being annoying or whatever because of the, the inherent issues that go with, with that parent-child relationship. And maybe some of those behavioral issues stem from a mental health condition that's been undiagnosed. So it's almost like, what do you expect? You know, the kid's acting out because they don't know how to deal with their mental health. But regardless of the fact, a lot of parents don't know what to do and will either bury their heads in the sand or they'll look the other way or they'll call it something else. And there are parents out there that, that do help and work and that kind of stuff. And your mom is one of those select few. And oh, yeah. it's incredible because the, the, I know the kind of support she's provided with you talking and listening and, and sure. supporting. And it's uh, we just got to give her props on the show. We got to give her some props because she deserves it. She, Absolutely. She, uh, yeah, she, she's, she's been party. amazing. She's, she's there every week taking me at my therapist, waiting in the waiting room. I, I, I'm telling you, I'm so blessed. Um, she's going to be very happy when she listens to this. <laughs> hey, mom. <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, you're right, Josh. I I was blessed. And Francesca, when you're like 95 years old, you know <laughs> you're going to have a daughter who's going to be like rolling you around. And it doesn't <laughs> matter if she can't see. They're going to have like bionic eyes at that time. So <laughs> we'll be fine. <laughs> Maria is going to take care of you. <laughs> yep, It'll be yep, all I good. Will. I'd be very happy to pay forward. The, the best price on assisted living you could find. <laughs> um, <laughs> but support systems are so huge and we can't manage and we can't, we almost can't step out onto that ledge or that plank uh, into what we think is the, the unknown of the abyss of reaching out and asking for help, that risk, you know. Right. But right. when we have, when we set up, you know, mom, grandma, best friend, counselor, crisis line, that's that net that's going to catch you. Because there's no way we could step off that, you know, uh, off that perceived ledge. And it's not a ledge at all. It's, it's really, there's going to be something there to catch you, but it's going to be an easier catch with those, with those people underneath. And, uh, and that's why we need support systems. Uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't be where I am today. I don't even think I'd be alive if it weren't for first my mom and then good friends and therapy and counseling. And, so the support system is so huge, and you, even though you were very against getting help, professional help, it was. It sounds to me like your mom was kind of like, "Oh no, we need this," and and you fell in line, and she was there to support you. And so, kudos. What do you think having a mental illness or multiple diagnoses? What do you think you learned because of that? What do you think that's added to your life experience and knowledge base? Yeah. So. You know, it's it's definitely made me stronger, I think, as a person. 
at the end mm-hmm. of the day. Um, just because I have to, you know, overcome so much, you know, um, and, and for those of you, or a lot of people that maybe, sure, we all experience depression, right? Everyone has a bad day. Um, but for those of it, uh, those those people who don't know what it's like to have a mental illness, like depression or anxiety, um, you know, some people just don't understand, you know. So, yeah, obviously it's made me stronger. And I think it's really made me a good advocate, not just for myself, or, but for other people who are going through what I'm going through. So I mm-hmm. think that's sort of the, the, the two things that I sort of can take a, think of, um, mm-hmm. I think, that, that have done for me, at least. So you've been able to connect and, and understand and empathize better, which in turn... I think will probably help you in your work because you are studying to be, well, you're studying mental health counseling. Am I right? Yes, I am. Mm -hmm. Exactly. And, and you're right. You know, one of the things that we do often in our program is we do these play roles because we want the therapist to kind of know what it feels like to be on both sides, both ends, and just to kind of, you know, having people come in and talk about depression and anxiety. I mean, you can read, Josh, all the books and articles. There are a ton and ton of articles out there that will tell you what depression is, what it looks like. But until you've experienced it yourself, I mean, you know, that's just going to change. I feel like it's, it's going to make me a stronger, you know, again, strong advocate for the person. And it's just going to give us a better connection. I'm going to I'm going to know what they're going through. So I think that's going to benefit that's something extra that I'm kind of glad I have. Not that I'm happy that I have my depression, right? And of exciting, not. but I. But in a way, I think it. You know, it's it's going to help somebody. A lot of people. And my usual question here would be, and I think I'm going to still ask it. How do you think having a mental illness or multiple? How do you think it's made your life better, if at all? Because you mentioned, ah, I don't want it. Of course, I don't want my depression. But I think that it's. Mm-hmm enriched my life in certain senses and that's what I choose to focus on. Sure. Did you find the same thing? Like are you are you able to focus on on some positive outcomes because of having your diagnosis? Oh yeah. I mean years ago I was just always I mean, you know, you grow up as a kid and you're like, you start thinking about what you're going to do in your life. And I mean, in in a million years I would have never thought that I'd be an author speaker. It was really never in my mind. So once all this stuff started coming at me, whether it was the blindness, the diagnosis, uh, the diagnosis of clinical and, and depression and anxiety, I mean, absolutely, it made me, I think I am where I am today, stronger and, you know, just because of all those, you know, and, and I always say I'm not my diagnosis, but I am very blessed. It sounds weird to say blessed because I, <laughs> uh, I'm i just, I'm just very blessed to, to be where I'm at today. And um, yeah, so kind of similar to what I said before, it's, just, you know, stronger than I ever thought I was. Yeah, it's, it's definitely put you in touch with inner strength and a different outlook. And you've been able to navigate life on life's terms. Because you practically, and I, I don't mean this funny or or confrontational, but you're you're practically nearly almost blind, and you have these yeah. mental health diagnoses. But you're not in a corner bitching and moaning and crying, which is which is a perfectly reasonable response for a certain amount of time. But you say, I'm going to go out and live. I'm going to be a speaker. I'm going to I want to tap my cane and get up on stage <laughs> and do my thing. In yeah. fact, you call your cane Casper, which I think is hilarious. Yeah. And <laughs> I wanted to explain to the audience why I call my cane Casper. Um, Please do. I just I ha- every time I use my cane, people are just so afraid of me, and then I just thought, "Oh my God, Casper, the friendly ghost." Okay, that's mm. that's my story, Josh. Please continue. <laughs> I can do it. No, I'm good. That was great. I don't think I don't think I remember that being explained so thoroughly after reading your book, but I might need to go back through it a few more times. In fact, I know I'm going to have to, but uh, that's yeah. really funny. Folks, don't be afraid of Maria if she's walking down the street with her cane. There's mm-hmm. other reasons to be afraid of her, but not because of the cane. <laughs> it's, it's, there's no the reason. Cane, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, the, it's that sinister look in her eyes. No, she's very friendly. <laughs> yeah, it's you like definitely almost turned... she's Sicilian. Yeah, exactly. She's, she's Sicilian. She's on fire. She's got a hell of a temper. Watch out, people. Oh. <laughs> Stereotyping.com. <laughs> <laughs> 
So you've you've definitely turned lemons into lemonade. We're going to get a little cliche here, but that's really what the show is about. You've turned impossible to I'm possible lemons into lemonade, and just a big kudos. And that's why that's a big reason why I wanted to have you on the show. And I want to have fun real quick. I want to have fun for a moment, and then we'll kind of get back to some some serious business. This is my quick fire round. This is our quick fire round here on the show, and these are just some fun questions that kind of pull us out of topic, but that give listeners a little insight into who you are and how you think and just you beyond the mental health and the blindness and, and issues and overcoming. So I don't know if you've ever seen Inside the Actor's Studio. It was one of my favorite shows as I got started out in the acting field. And they interview actors, and it's it's a little pretentious, but hopefully this won't be as pretentious or seen that way. But here we go. No perfect answers. Okay. Go for whatever comes to mind. And if not, okay. we'll, if you have to think for 20 minutes, I'll edit it out and post. But here we go. So, okay. Maria... <laughs> What is your favorite word? Apparently, I say absolutely a lot. Absolutely. I oh, I was, I, I, I was, too many I was times. agreeing with you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> absolutely. Yes. Yeah, okay, I've been saying that word a lot. Cool. How do you yeah. say that in Italian? Yeah. Absolutamente? Uh, we could say assolutamente, or we could say sicuramente is another way of saying it. So those All right. Two. Ladies and gentlemen, that's your Italian lesson for today. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> I am one of What is your yes, yes. What is your least favorite word? Probably, um absolutely no, I'm kidding. <laughs> uh, I think it's I think it's crazy. Agreed. Crazy is one of my least favorites as well. It's so loaded. So loaded. And in fact And we overuse it. Oh, we so overuse it. That's so crazy. You're right. Yeah. No, it's, we do overuse crazy. it. <laughs> I'm a big fan crazy. because it kinda like it, it it has a similar meaning and I might even have to take this out of my vocab. Well, I'm a big fan of, of cray cray because it's a little more oh. silly and it definitely is not like it no, definitely it it's, to me it doesn't connote or, or connotate uh I'm gonna say that wrong, but it doesn't denote like lunacy or that loadedness. It's more like mm-hmm. that's silly or you know what I mean? So like I'm I'm substituting yeah. a lot with cray cray, which is a little like sixteen year old girl, but I I'm good with that. I'm I'm comfortable. No, that's, so that's crazy. Much better. Yeah, cray. Yeah. <laughs> cry, cry. Um, <laughs> I love that. Oh. oh my god, that might be my new favorite word. <laughs> cray, it's a hyphenated word too. So you gotta go, cray, 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 cray. You right. are about to be a published <laughs> author. Well, you are. Well, you are actually in in our first line possible mm-hmm. book and reengaging with life, creating mm-hmm. a new you. But you do have a book coming out, and so I want to ask this question. Okay. I asked another author guest of mine, and it just kind of came to mind. What's your favorite piece of punctuation? Okay, I have one. I'm obsessed with ellipsis because mm. they just that's look very cool. Yeah, and because it's just like, if I could use them like all the time, I would. <laughs> and that would be very that's weird. That's yes. It would I be because it's like almost that, like you're trailing off right? or you're like emphasizing. You are. It's a stylistic choice, exactly. right? And then yeah. it's just like, there's there's just like more to, you know what I mean? Sometimes you're just listing mm. a bunch of things and then it's like, but there's da, 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 da. There's more, you know? Mm. That, that's, Oh, and, that's my favorite. Good question. And you're and, and you're like and you're leaving it up to the reader's imagination and not telling them what to think or to feel or, or painting by numbers. That's a good. I like that. That's a good reason exactly. to use that. So we got three more. Who or what is your spirit animal? Spirit animal? Oh my God, I don't really have a spirit. Aren't you Catholic? <laughs> you have a spirit. <laughs> <laughs> no, I have a spirit, but like a spirit animal that's like a funny question how about your mom know. your mom can be your spirit animal okay she could be my spirit you animal that? So, gonna say yes are you, that? so are you talking about yeah we could say yes to that so are you i thought you were referring us to some something that's like alive or someone that's like not you could say uh, you know i'm so i am so open to whatever a spirit animal is like if that doorknob is your spirit animal that's cool like it's it's really kind of like just very fun it started out people were like oh a lion's my spirit animal a rhinoceros because a rhinoceros lays in water and lets birds sit on them and i do that i don't really care like it could be anything you could be abraham the spirit of abraham lincoln is my spirit animal or i mean i just, whatever i just love dogs and i have two amazing shih tzus. So I guess I could say like my dog. They're they're just yeah different. yeah. I met one of them. Did you, and, uh, did you meet Happy or Lucky? I don't remember. They all look the same to me. I think <laughs> they do. <laughs> <laughs> Doberman, you know, the Beethoven dog, the Fraser dog. They all look the same to me. They don't really. But <laughs> um, this could be a fun one, depending on <laughs> how much the sense of humor you have, and you have a good one. 
What are you terrible at? Oh my God, this is such a great question. Okay. I'm not terrible at anything. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Humility. Um, <laughs> oh my God, I actually had to think about this one. Not because I think I'm like the best in everything, but it's one of those things like, I, I might be terrible at being put on the spot and answering these kinds of questions. Does uh, that count? Uh, it can Does count. count? I, I was going to go with okay. driving, but fine. But that's just oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I I just have a feeling I'd be very good at driving. I don't think I'd be bad at it. Oh, you'd be you'd be good at it, yeah. I we'll think so. I think I'd bad. be pretty good. Fair enough. So being put on the spot, <laughs> that's your final answer. Last one. Yeah, okay. Last one. <laughs> so okay. Last one. If heaven exists, if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say to you as you enter or as you get kicked out? <laughs> I like to think of myself as like, little angels sometimes. <laughs> so I would, sure. I would <laughs> So at least most most of the time I'm pretty good. So I'd like to think of him saying like I know this is gonna be total so cliche. Um but I feel like he might just be like, Oh my god, I'm so proud of you. You've been like I mean mm. yeah. I like that. I and I think I think that'll be heard. I think you'll you'll definitely hear that. In fact I just have to point out though a very Something that's funny to me is that God actually says, oh, my God. Like, that's cool. Oh. Like, I'm like, oh, my me? Oh, my Josh. Like, you're, like, you're such God. an ass. But God can do it. God's cool with that. He can do whatever he, he or she can do whatever they want. Um, but, yeah, I think you're definitely getting in. By the way, every yeah, guest funny. on my show thinks are getting in. So I, 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 I can't wait to play this at the pearly gates and be like, mm, sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but I think you're getting in, so... And I think I mm-hmm. think the the big man or the big woman will uh, will definitely welcome you with open arms and be appreciative as to what you're giving back. So, what does the next six months to a year look like for you? What does the future hold? What do you, what is your vision for the next six months to a year? What's going down in Maria's world? No, like literally, vision? No, I'm kidding. Ha ha ha. Sorry. Yeah. Right. All right. No. Okay. So, well, yeah, that's a good question. I mean. There's there's a couple of things I have in mind. Um, one of them is obviously I have two more years of my to complete my master's. Right. So I'm looking forward to that, just kind of continuing to um, and really just do more motivational speaking. The writing thing is always something um, that's fun mm. I enjoy doing. And and really, I mean, this one's kind of cliche, but like I really do hope that I can continue to work toward like reducing that stigma that's a sur- surrounded like with mental and physical disabilities. And, and really, I hope to work with professionals in the mental health field eventually. And then one of the things, actually, this one you mentioned, and it was, I, I did co-found a, an I for Cure campaign. And, and really, I hope to actually kind of expand that. That would be the dream to, like, work with manufacturers and I manufacturers and retailers and to kind of just expand that a little bit. Because I really do also want to continue to fight the stigma that's around the you know, associated with mm. blindness. Mm. Let's see, what else do I want to do? I mean, that's really don't just... You have, don't you have a book coming out, and don't you want to talk about it for a second? Goodness. Oh, my God, absolutely. <laughs> Say something about it. I know, it I, just got, I just got cut up in all my stuff. No, you're fine. Oh my, my vision, and I just got all really yeah, excited. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I am very excited to talk about my book, so I'm glad you remembered. So, what is it? What's the title? What's it about? Yeah. Okay, so, well, first of all, let's start with the title. The book is called Now I See How I Battle Blindness, Mental Illness, and Espresso Habit, and Live to Tell the Tale. So people have heard me say, talk about today my, my blindness, my mental illness, um, but ladies and gentlemen, I have a, an espresso habit, a, a, a big problem. <laughs> so, and, and really just, you know, the, the book talks about really kind of what I told you at the beginning, but it really just sort of expands on, like, talking about what it was like losing my vision at 14 years old, Um, and then it kind of just tells you a little bit more about the play and and, and just, you know, the resources and really how I overcame and how I live with, you know, depression and anxiety and and my blindness. There was a lot of accepting I needed to do, and so really the book kind of just gets into it a little bit, and there's also, uh, there's actually a favorite section in the book that really explains when we, some people like start to freak out when they see someone that has a disability and don't really know what to do. So there's like a little section where I have like what they should do, like the do's and not to do. 
kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. hopefully that will help people, you know, maybe next time they see someone who's blind or has a disability, maybe instead of like running away from that person, you can sort of like they can kind of just think of sort of some of my suggestions. Um, mm. So that's that's cool. And um, so the book is in pre-order right now. Um, people can go on my website at embracingyourdifferences.com slash pre-order. They can pre-order a copy, get an autograph by me, special. They can get a free book. And shipping is free in the U.S., people. So get those copies. I think you're going to get a great deal. The official release date is going to be October 3rd, um, and I'm looking forward to not just having the paperback copy, but I'm going to also have an ebook. and by the end of the year, which I think a lot of people are going to be excited about, I, I know I am, I'm going to have an audiobook. Yeah. You can find the yeah. book at embracingyourdifferencesblog.wordpress.com, and we'll have that mm-hmm. link in the show notes. And I know a lot about this book, and there's some so there's a fun literary device that you employ with integrating original poetry that kind of helps introduce certain ideas and things that have happened in your life and being of a of a younger age and kind of going backwards to to show how you got where you were and then kind of moving forward from a certain point. So I think the poetry thing is is one of my favorite components of what your book is because it makes it even though it's an interesting book and story it makes it even more palatable and relatable and it just gives another sort of, I guess, a touch point as to explaining things, but without beating it over someone's head. So I like, I like that as a, as a writer myself. So um, I do, I recommend the book. I think it's, I think it's fantastic and I think people will get a lot out of it and want to encourage folks to get over there. If people want to get in touch with you and figure out either how to order the book or to check in with your blog or to keep progress on you, how do they get in touch with you, if at all? Sure. That's the best way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so um, kind of what I mentioned before, I, probably the easiest and quickest way is to go on my website at embracingyourdifferences.com. And then once you're on my website, you can go under, it says, um, one of the menus, it says contact. So you can, you're going to see my email on there too, which I will be happy to say again, um, it's embracingdifferences01 at gmail.com. And then once you're on my website, you'll be able to see all my, you know, social media stuff, my Twitter, my Instagram account, and my Facebook page. So yeah, that's, that's sort of the best way to get in touch and, you know, people just want to say hi or just kind of, you know, chat or I, I always enjoy doing that. Awesome. Super. I'm, I will do that, folks. Get in touch with Maria. Check out that book. There's there's lots of good, juicy stuff in there, storytelling-wise, and then mental health stuff. It's in there, definitely not beating anyone over the head. It's a very palatable and fun way to approach it. And so do check that out. Thank you again, Maria, for coming on to the show. It was really a joy to have you on and to hear you and to so hear about the great me. things that are going on. My pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. You've been listening to the I'm Possible Project Show with Joshua Rivetall and guest Maria Grazia Butita. I love sharing stories and how to turn impossible into I'm Possible. If you want more inspirational stories, our second and third books are available right now. Changing Minds, Breaking Stigma, Achieving the Impossible, as well as Lemonade Stand. Both contain powerful stories of overcoming tremendous odds. When life gives you lemons, squeeze, add sugar, and pick up a copy of the I'm Possible Project. That's IAMPossibleProject.com slash 2 slash T-W-O or IAMPossibleProject.com slash Lemonade. Thank you so much for tuning in. You're more than a community. You're part of the I'm Possible family. Until next time, sending you lots of love.